All right, on a little bit of a hiatus as we were out at one of the crypto events out there. So we're back in studio now. It's going to be a fun one. We're going to dive into Bitcoin today. Talk a little bit about where the future of Bitcoin goes, but also some of the impacts that could still cause some ripples within the Bitcoin price ecosystem. All that good stuff. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Let's get into it today. Uh, we do have a special guest on. I do want to thank our sponsor, though, and that is Trezor. If you're looking to get into self-custody, there's a couple of solutions out there. This is one of them. Uh, and Trezor does a great job. Make sure and check them out. They've got a handful of tokens and all sorts of stuff. And they've got their newest, uh, which I think is one of, I have one of these. I like the, the new screen on these. So this is kind of a, a little bit of a, a cool tool. And if you're like me, self-custody is probably the number one place that you're storing whatever you're buying out there in the crypto or Bitcoin space. So make sure and check out the link below. Just use that. Uh, it helps the channel out. Let's get into it today. Uh, joining me, of course, is Mr. Corey Clepston coming over from Swan Bitcoin. Had him on the show before. Corey, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, I love that you're sponsored by Trezor, by the way. They're a, <laughs> a big partner of ours. And uh, they actually announced at the Bitcoin conference down in Miami earlier this year that uh, yeah. you can buy directly in the Trezor suite with, uh, with Swan, that. my company. Yeah. I actually just go. did their monthly Twitter spaces this morning. That was my, my cool. first media appearance of the day was, was with those guys. <laughs> They have a good product. I like it. I use both the Ledger and the Trezor, and I would be hard-pressed to choose between which one I would use, but I like the Trezor just because of the screen. Uh, you know, I like the Ledger, but that's a, another conversation. Let's get into it a little bit, Corey. I want to just reference a tweet that uh, you put out a little while ago. It was on the 14th of November here, uh, calling BS on Luna, Celsius, FTX, uh, obviously all collapsing. You, you're gaining some credibility in the space around this of, of kind of catching these uh, early situations that start to occur. And today we want to break down a little bit about the VC aspect. And as I look at the VCs, my background in technology, I've been in Silicon Valley before. I kind of know a little bit about how the magic is made in these guys. Not necessarily uh, a great thing. It's been investing in the, you know, the tech community for a long time. It's a little different angle of what's happening, of how they invest in these ICOs and these tokens. And for our audience, some people may not really understand that. So I'd love for you to give a breakdown of how you think or you're analyzing how these VCs are going into the crypto market, kind of creating their own printing presses, so to speak, and impacting a lot of what we're seeing in the market right now. Where do you see this, uh, this kind of impacting overall? Yeah, so I think what you're seeing in... What is really a misnomer? This is not this is not venture capital as understood right. by, by people who've been around for a long time. This is actually just um, the marketing of pump and dumps, mm -hmm. and so it's the search for you know a few PhDs that you can market or some kind of plausible story that you can attach a token to, and then you market the hell out of it, and you try to uh, create signal by getting some other big name folks to get on board to pump it with you and yeah. then you dump it after you've run the price up a bit and that's what Andreessen Horowitz keeps on doing over and over again um, which is a shame because you know this was uh, a pretty innovative venture firm and I've still got friends over there that work in things other than crypto but I don't consider what's going on in in I have to put both crypto and VC in quotes because neither of them actually mean <laughs> what people pretend right. that they do. Um, but yeah, crypto VC is basically just uh, Ponzi marketing. So you look at Andreessen, uh, A16Z, uh, I mean, Dixon over there, there's many A16Z, of those guys. A16Z crypto, yeah. So him yeah. and Ali Yaya and, you know, basically everybody else working on the on the crypto stuff right. over there uh, are just Ponzi marketers. Which is, is, is really kind of the question, because many people would look at A16Z and Multicoin as kind of the, some of the, the champions of the industry, so to speak. If you look back eight months ago, many people would look at any project that those two companies were looking at or participated in as maybe a positive. Obviously, what we're starting to see out in the market now is maybe that wasn't necessarily a positive, it was a negative. Uh, probably a potential. Well, if you if you got the signal the from them, if you got the signal from them early enough that you got in on the pump, and then you timed sure. your dump well enough, then maybe you could make money. But this gets yeah. down to the difference between Bitcoin and, and non-Bitcoin crypto in general, which is that you know Bitcoin is 
a store of value that's likely to become global money and a global reserve asset and non-Bitcoin crypto in its best use case is for greater fool trading or gambling where you're basically trying to catch something that's moving where it's on the way up and then you got to get rid of it. It's a hot potato and you got to sell it before yeah. it goes down. You know, and this is where we ran the analysis over the summer that uh, only three out of 22,000 altcoins have ever had a new all time high in Bitcoin terms three or more years after their first all time high. So literally only Ripple mm. in 2017 was higher than 2013. Uh, Doge got pumped by Elon in 2021. So it was higher than what it hit in 2017. And BNB, the Binance exchange token, which I wouldn't even really consider an altcoin because it's completely centrally controlled and it's just like, you know, CZ's thinly traded totally manipulated currency in his own ecosystem. Um, but it it launched in 2017, so it didn't get a full pump in 2017. Literally everything else just bleeds out against Bitcoin over time. So again, crypto is for gambling or trading uh, if you're good at it. Um, and then Bitcoin is actually something that's real. Yeah. Well, and we're going to get a chance to kind of take a look at the, the ecosystem because we continue to see a little bit of the contagion effect, obviously, from the FTX fallout. Likelihood is we'll see some more players that will get into that. I want to jump into that before we leave the VC side or pseudo yeah. VC of what we're looking at. And I, I'm looking toward this next cycle because there's going to be a whole slew of new crypto companies and blockchain entities yeah. that kind of make their way into it. You've got Katie Hahn coming in with a new fund. Uh, interesting timing for her. This is a one point, I think it's a $1.5 billion fund uh, where she's really looking at the next run on this. And with that being the case, is this just another scenario that we've seen with A16 or other types of entities mm -hmm. like that? Or do you think this might start to maybe open up some new innovation in Bitcoin, you know, innovation, other technologies that could kind of flank along uh, blockchain? Mm, well, so I don't see them contributing much to Bitcoin. Um, because there's no token for them to pump. So they won't do that. They're looking for something that they can get, uh, you know, the only two slides that you need in a, in a deck to raise money from LPs for a, a crypto VC fund are the first is short time to liquidity, which means that you can dump this thing fairly quickly on dumb institutional and retail. Um, and the other one is uh, we make our own weather, which is just basically pointing out that as long as the rules on the books are not being enforced, for these crypto securities, um, you can say whatever you want about them. You can sprinkle some mm. DeFi blockchain crypto magic on it and claim it's going to do this, that, or the other. And you never have to have product market fit. You never have to have revenue. Uh, you never have to have any scrutiny of your claims. And you can still get public, essentially, like, like an IPO. You're selling the security on these right. unregulated exchanges around the world. And you can get out of your position. And, and further, you can manipulate the hell out of the markets themselves because all of these centralized token projects and their VCs uh, would never launch a token without paying market makers to go and paint the chart and try to make it look like it's pumping. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't have in your plan uh, which market makers you're planning to contract with and how much of the token and how much Bitcoin and how much USDC or Tether you're planning to send under the control to fund the market makers to paint the chart and make it look like it's pumping um, and support the price of the token. So literally they say support the price of the token. That just means market manipulation and it means fooling dumb institutional and retail into thinking that there's actually something here. Um, but that's that's what you have to do if you want to succeed in crypto VC is uh, lie and recruit the greater fool investor to come and join your pump. Mm. With that being the case, I mean, you look at the scenarios that we've dealt with over the past several years, I think a lot of institutional capital, they obviously have gotten black eyes, uh, been caught, you know, in the FTX scenario. You've got many people that were caught in that that were really, I think, good, you know, good traders and or good companies that were trying to do things and they kept their treasury in FTX. That, of course, has now disintegrated a lot of companies. And you look at that and what's happened, and many people look back and say, hey, listen, we need these bad actors out of here. Eventually, this is a, it's going, you know, kind of a short-term situation for what yeah. could be a future opportunity. With that being the case, and especially around the, the back to the VC thing, do you think there's any cycle out of here at all? Is there any way this becomes a reputable approach toward building technology in the future, at least in this space? What are your thoughts? 
Yeah. Well, first I would challenge the idea that there are very many good investors or good traders um, in crypto. Um, you know, there are very few shops that actually are run, that, that operate heavily in the crypto space that are run by people that have actually been successful traders in, in traditional markets coming from options, things like that. When you do find someone that actually understands trading operations and understands risk and actually comes from that world, like the 0.72s or the, you know, the Susquehanna's or even the jump mm -hmm. capital guys, because they have a huge franchise outside of crypto before they got into crypto. Um, you know, what you see is those guys don't blow up. It's usually the guys like Kyle and Jusu that, you know, met in college and got straight into crypto and have a bunch of, right. you know, social, social credibility in crypto because they've been around for a while and it's like assets beget assets. But like these guys don't actually have credibility in traditional markets. Same thing with Sam Bankman Fried and all these people at Alameda, like they were, you know, either washouts or just, you know, neophytes when it came to the real hedge fund world and, and really didn't have any sort of track record whatsoever, no credibility to be able to run an exchange, let alone, you know, a prop trading desk or market maker of the size that they purported to run. So it's really not surprising at all that these people with no credibility, no experience and no track record keep on blowing up. You know, I think this is, um, it's somewhat of- I mean, Kyle DNA. Samani, like let's, like you mentioned him and I didn't, I didn't drag Kyle enough, like that guy- yeah hasn't said a true <laughs> word in five or six years. Like he doesn't believe the things that he says at all. Um, it's just to market and sell and gather assets for, for his uh, pile of LP money and clock those fees. But he doesn't, That's he didn't believe the things that he used to write about EOS. He doesn't believe the things that he used to write about Solana. Um, this guy was not a money manager before he got into crypto. Remember he was like a Google Glass developer. You yeah. know, that was the kind of origin story he got into crypto because, you know, Google rug pulled him on, on, on Google Glass or something like that. But, you know, uh, listen, if you're a good risk manager and a good steward of capital, you don't keep 50% of your funds capital on something like FTX. You'd have none no. on FTX because you'd actually understand what FTX was because you'd ask hard questions. So there are a lot of investors, institutional investors that didn't deal with FTX, that wouldn't lend to Alameda, that didn't get the, an the questions answered. When Sam said, no, I can't send you the financials, they said, F off. When, you know, Alameda's you know, when the, they didn't pass diligence on who their counterparties were, they wouldn't lend to Alameda. And yeah. so this idea that like, oh, you know, one bad egg. No, there's a ton of absolute buffoonery and incompetence in the non-Bitcoin crypto space. And I think it's mostly just a bunch of jokers. Well, I think, you, you know, to a certain level, you're right. If you're really a, a fiduciary responsible individual that understands at least a little bit about the market. Self-custody is really the easy route for any of this, whether it's any asset, much less what's happening in and out of what's going on with FTX. With I, I want to jump to FTX for just a second. Um, you know, I, I think this one's kind of been beat pretty heavily. Obviously, we still don't know why uh, Sam Bankman and Fareed is still walking around. That This is still blowing my mind. But the connection to his mom and his dad and the tie-in to what we're seeing with a lot of political inroads, what we are now seeing maybe as a sidestep from the Democratic Party and others that have taken significant amount of uh, funding, which really uh, FTX could have been just a, a, you know, a Ponzi scheme that was rolling in cash into a variety of different entities out there, some political, some others. Is this ever gonna be a situation that we see regulators come at this problem, especially as it relates to FTX? Or do you think this is just going to get swept under the rug? So regulators are going to try and we'll see how much influence uh, he's already purchased, you know? So it appears, you know, well over $200 million uh, between his own contributions and uh, the contributions of his mother's political action committee, mm -hmm. um, which I think did 140 on its own. Um, and then now he stated yesterday that he gave an equal amount to Republicans, but did it all through PACs, um, so dark money, basically, where you can't see that, uh, that he gave the money. We'll see whether that ends up being true or not. But regardless, the, the game afoot for Andreessen Horowitz, for Coinbase, for Joe Lubin, the Ethereum Foundation consensus, and for FTX and Alameda and SAM has been for a number of years uh, to wrest oversight 
of non-Bitcoin crypto away from the SEC and try yeah, to get it over to the CFTC. Sure. So it's been dang, it's basically been, you know, hiring uh, Chris Giancarlo and, and, and former CFTC people as staff and as their law firms and basically just lining their pockets and trying to influence the CFTC, dangling massive amounts of fees that they would willingly and, and you know, gleefully pay for a light touch um, from a regulator that was willing to fight for them and, and, and take them on. Um, and basically anything other than applying the laws on the books to their industry. Yeah. Right? So that's been the game afoot. Um, unfortunately for the crypto scam industry, they let Sam Bankman Fried take the lead on this in a big way. And he was the name most associated with lobbying in DC with making all these big campaign contributions. And so now I just can't imagine that they succeed in this effort to purchase another decade of of free scamming by moving it over to the CFTC and getting all this shit, these things, sorry. Uh, you can bleep that out. Um, I do a lot of Bitcoin shows and we swear freely over there. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I completely get it. To, uh, to, get, to get all of these, uh, you know, these, these uh, tokens regulated as commodities, I just don't see them actually succeeding in that at this point. Um, one interesting angle that I think you're kind of getting at, uh, and I haven't seen this actually written about, I've seen it tweeted about a couple of times is, you know, the cycle just happened, the election cycle, yeah. and a lot mm -hmm. of the donations were made you know, at the 11th hour to fund TV budgets and mailers right up until election day. And they went into receivership very quickly right after election day. And the way that works is the trustee can go and claw back anything that went out the door in the 90 days uh, preceding bankruptcy. Bingo. So you can imagine all of the recipients on both sides of the aisle of tens of millions of dollars that have already spent that money. And then the trustee coming and trying to claw that money back. Uh, from the campaigns that spent the ill-gotten gains. They just basically took stolen money from FTX customers and spent it on political ads. And you could see these politicians and these parties actually fighting against any clawback. And the only way to do that is to say, oh, it was just a blow up. It wasn't a fraud. Right. And so I, I right. could see really like both parties and the entire New York media machine and all of Silicon Valley kind of banding together and trying to help this guy get away scot-free. It really might happen that way. And they'll blame it on something about him being in a different jurisdiction, but really they're just cutting deals and letting him walk free in the Bahamas and just not come back yeah. to the US. Yeah, so I think that that is something that we've looked at and the angle of that, of being able to kind of soften that blow, at least from the DC side of things. With that being the case, this money still stays in the banks. We still see the political you know, unjust situation kind of occur. Do you think there will be any, be any, uh, you know, beholding of those parties to say, all right, let's continue on down this path of what the regulatory direction was, or do you think they kind of run amok on regulation and we do see the SEC really taking a bigger stance on all of this? Yeah, I think this this uh, this clears the path for the SEC to go much harder and and have much less opposition. It's really hard to have a principled stance or even make any any kind of logical case for the stuff not to be regulated by the SEC at mm -hmm. this point. Um, right. You know, I always say, like, don't be pro-regulation, be anti-hypocrisy. And it's like, you know, if you've been in D.C. for 10 years, banging the table and saying, like, you know, we shouldn't regulate MLM schemes and, you know, every penny stock operator from Jordan Belfort should be able to send direct mailers to the nursing home and, you know, get your grandma to send away your inheritance to some penny stock. You know, if you've been saying, like, I just don't want regulation at all, that's fine. That's a principled stance. But if you haven't been that person and you haven't been sort of like the hardcore, you know, anarchy, libertarian type, then what are you doing being the drum for right. not regulating crypto the same way? Like, there's nothing special about this. It's just more scams and schemes. Yeah. And even if you think they're just the same as stocks for companies, because these are centrally controlled things, they all pass the Howey test, including Ethereum. Um, and Ripple, obviously, and, you know, Cardano, any of these things are centrally controlled and manipulated and, and basically exist to pump the token price. Um, so there's really just no difference there between between non-Bitcoin crypto and securities. Only Bitcoin is is not a security. 
Well, this would be a big, uh, obviously, the uh, situation with uh, XRP and Ripple. If this rolls out and the judge does award Ripple uh, a win on this, do you think this has any effect? I actually don't know what you're talking about. A win on what? Uh, a win on the Ripple case, uh, where the SEC is going against Ripple as a security. Oh. Holding the uh, XRP case as a security. Yeah, I'm not following it. I haven't followed oh, Ripple okay. in years. It's just so obviously right. a scam. Well, okay, so you know, I think most of our audience will follow that case, and they look at XRP kind of being propped up right now because of the Ripple case. The Ripple case has gone okay. through about, I don't know, a year and a half. Yeah, so for, for any Ripple fans the out SEC. there that have been... For any Ripple fans that have been potentially bamboozled by by Chris and Brad and, and these guys over the years, uh, Ripple created XRP. It's very clear. It's been proven a million times. It's all documented. They didn't discover it. They weren't granted it. They created it out of whole cloth and granted most of it to themselves. And they've been just uh, marketing the hell out of it for the last eight, nine years and dumping it on people's heads. So um, absolutely a security, absolutely a fraud and a complete joke. And I'm sorry you got caught up in it. But there's still time. Get out while you can. A, tr a true Bitcoin maxi here <laughs> on this show. I'm not today. a Bitcoin maximalist. It, I'm, I'm not actually, and I reject I reject that term. Okay. Vitalik right. created what, the term what maximalist. Would, what would you say? And then people say, say that... Bitcoin maxi, which is like a diminutive of an epithet. Um, so no, I, I just reject that. <laughs> I think I like Bitcoin. I call myself a Bitcoiner. Um, I think true Bitcoin. I'm a rationalist. There you go. I'm a rationalist, but you know, I don't think it. I don't think it helps to you know take someone who is trying to talk about what's true and what's not true, and and try to label them and paint them with a brush, uh, which is what Vitalik obviously tried to do with the term Bitcoin maximalist. Interesting. Um, Interesting. So yeah, I, I reject that. Okay. Well, then there we get to use Bitcoiner here instead of Maxis, which I think Thank is you. a better thing, even though uh, we do see ETH Maxis being you know called out in the space quite a bit. I want to get to, all right, so let's, and remember guys, if you guys are interested in these kinds of content pieces, make sure and smash the like. We'd love to get your feedback, drop some questions in over on the side. I want, and we're going to get into Bitcoin price, not projection, but, you know, the allowance of where Bitcoin could go. Obviously, a lot of this is being applied by not only macro efforts, what we're seeing in the space, all of this has a contributing factor into the price of where Bitcoin is today. Yeah. If you look at it, it, just look at the Fed uh, chair. This is Jerome Powell saying that essentially signaling a little bit is that we could see a lift of interest rates, uh, maybe uh, a half percentage point in December. This would be a very interesting move if this occurs, which to, could start to kind of, I don't know that I would call that a pivot, but how does the, the macro side of things from not only the Fed, but also what's happening in the space really affect Bitcoin uh, in its current state in terms of price? Yeah, I mean, obviously, anything that's sort of out on the risk curve for large piles of money uh, becomes more attractive if money gets a little bit easier. And that second derivative of, of you know, the, the increase is slowing a little bit uh, probably means that the Fed thinks they, they may have a, a little bit more of a handle on inflation or the worst is behind us or something like that. And so, you know, I, all, all indicators of what's going on in the economy uh, from anyone... <laughs> who's being realistic, uh, it doesn't, doesn't paint a rosy picture um, for what's ahead. And so I think they're probably just trying to get out ahead of that a little bit and, uh, you know, maybe dodge, dodge getting <laughs> in a, a lot of the blame for what's probably coming up in the next year or two. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that we've seen a recession yet. And, uh, and there's probably, you know, chances would say that there's probably one coming. Yeah, I think everybody looks at uh, 2023 as a potential for recession. You know, the continued scenario that we, even though we will see some uh, light relief pressure off of what's happening, at least from an inflationary standpoint, I do think, you know, we'll probably see some slowing on the interest rate hikes, all that. But the problem we have, obviously, is uh, dealing with credit and, and the job situation that's going to continue to pressure the U.S. economy anyway. So I think yeah. that's definitely going to be something that plays into this. I want to jump to an article. This was a piece that came in. And it says, Bitcoin's current stability stems from market manipulation. This comes from the ECP. Um, and if you look at what they're claiming, and again, I think this is 
uh, a little bit of just paving the way for a, a, a digital, you know, a digital currency, a central bank digital currency. But they're kind of jumping to this whole idea is that uh, Bitcoin is, is in its final stages of becoming irrelevant due to its many shortcomings. And this is all coming again from what I think is kind of pitching their own book. But value stems from mere speculation and its recent stability was a result of price manipulation. So what we've seen with many people would look at where the price of Bitcoin is today. What's happened with uh, FTX, Voyager, Celsius, Luna, all of that has kind of had a roll-up effect, obviously, on Bitcoin itself. How do you think and do you think the central bank authorities will start to pressure Bitcoin further as they have like in this report? And how do you think that Bitcoin's going to respond? Well, the blow up of basically everyone who piled leverage into the crypto space uh, over the past few years, uh, that's probably the best tool that the powers that be in the fiat system would have had to mm -hmm. suppress the price of Bitcoin the way that they have precious metals over the years, right? It's selling claims. Yep against gold or IOUs, essentially fractional reserve uh, of an asset that they don't want to see rise. And that's been happening with Bitcoin a lot. I mean, we know billions of dollars of Bitcoin was sold on FTX that didn't exist, for instance. Um, and so a lot of the demand, so it's not, it's not just that there was artificial supply created, it's also that the demand for real Bitcoin settled on chain and you know, held in self-custody or held with like a legitimate custodian that's, that's not rehypothecating and lending it out. Uh, the demand for real Bitcoin was suppressed dramatically as well. This is something that uh, Caitlin Long has highlighted that uh, uh, Ludwig uh, Mises wrote about quite a bit back in the day about gold, and it applies here to Bitcoin as well. So you saw an increase in supply and a decrease in demand because of uh, leverage in the system by these bad actors. Uh, you know, and, and the funny thing is just, just for your audience to understand a little bit of a history of what actually started all of this is that a lot of the CFI lenders actually blew up in Q2 of 2021 and had mm -hmm. blown massive holes in their balance sheet. And that was because they were so off sides on the GBTC arb trade. So all of these yield products, that was the only consistent source of yield in size was, yeah. was basically institutional investors parking huge piles of Bitcoin or cash, uh, checking it into GBTC and then selling it at a premium to NAV six months later. It used to be a year, then they moved it to six months and then people really piled into the trade. And what happened is like, you know, just like your buddy who was a bartender in 2003 and he bought a house and flipped it, then he bought two houses and flipped it, then he bought four houses and flipped it. Mm -hmm. And then he went big in 2007 and he bought 20 houses in Vegas and Phoenix and Mexico and, you know, lost more money than he'd ever made historically. That's what happened with all these crypto firms, right? This is Celsius blew up in, in spring, summer of 2021 and got bailed out by, um, West Cap, it looks like, who then went and, you know, packaged it up and, and didn't announce the round and then sold it to the pension fund at a higher valuation later that year. It appears that's probably what happened there. Uh, BlockFi was able to paper over their massive hole in their balance sheet uh, in 2021 by raising a lot more money just through kind of the, the pump of, of right. the Bitcoin price, making people excited. And they got one more round done to kick the can down the road. It's very probable that you know, there were holes in the balance sheet and essentially the whole industry of of crypto gambling was trying to dig themselves out of the hole by going further out of the on the risk curve with more leverage. That's probably what created the Luna pump. Yeah, as well, because well, they I think were, a lot of people had, kind of thought Bitcoin was going to be in a lot further position. Uh, everybody was looking at Bitcoin going to a much higher all time high. <laughs> Uh, during this last, yeah. so I think they just they kind of just they got were caught that a, that volume was never there on the retail side though the volume was never there on the retail side the second pump of 2021 was an institutional mm -hmm. pump institutional pump and yeah. I've seen I've seen credible analysis that on balance I believe to be true that it was actually Alameda spoofing orders and creating the echo boom the echo bubble of 2021 mm -hmm. through the fall specifically to pump their Solana bags because you couldn't get an altcoin to pump unless Bitcoin was With actually Bitcoin. in a bit yeah. of a bull market as well. And so it was worth it to them to use their position as a market maker on the big exchanges. Uh, their percentage of spoofed orders was just off the charts, like 98% or something like that all through the uh, the time they were running these algorithms. The, the order book when 
on Coinbase, for instance, Coinbase Pro, when their when their algorithm is running versus when it's not, looks dramatically different. This is not my world. I think it's just something that people are looking into and have frankly been writing about since 2021 that it was yeah. essentially market manipulation, and it was just so. Uh, Sam and Andreessen Horowitz and Jump Capital and these other guys could dump their Solana bags because uh, their bags hadn't hadn't gone up enough, and so you know maybe they spent a billion dollars to make fifteen billion or something like that. Well, I, okay, so let me get this right because uh, MultiCoin was really kind of in the Solana camp along with David Sachs and many of the others within Silicon mm -hmm. Valley that have kind of propped up Solana, which has been the challenge yeah. that I've kind of had with Solana all along, other than the issue that it has, you know, with just network stability, which is another, you know, another discussion. Yeah. But, you know, or just the, the first principles issue that, you know, in a race to the bottom toward mm -hmm. being faster, more transactions, right, you know, cheaper to use, you end up at spreadsheets, you end up on AWS or Google Cloud, yeah. right? Yeah, um, exactly. So if you if you go from if you go from Bitcoin to Ethereum, then you go from Ethereum to Solana, then you're going to go from Solana to Aptos, and eventually you're just going to end up on a cloud service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is you know this is the challenge I think, and it's one that we've talked about with Solana often here recently, and you know I'm back and forth on it. I love you know I, I see what they're doing you know from a technology and app side of things, but that's a whole different conversation. I want to stay on uh, the tone here because we want to talk about. Yeah. The next, you know, the next potential crater that let could me, happen. Let me just sidetrack one one thing. It, okay. Your 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 mention of an ETH maxi uh, tickled my brain for a minute, and so okay. there there's an exercise uh, that I thought I was the first <laughs> to do it. It turns out people have asked this question before, and I just didn't know. But um, so I tweeted out. Uh, about 10 days ago, it says, I'm looking for a unicorn. This person, one, has 15 plus years experience and deep expertise in distributed systems, network architecture, and free open source software. Two, has no crypto related compensation. Three, has a deep understanding of both Bitcoin and Ethereum. And four, thinks Ethereum is going to make it. This is a null set. There is no human on the planet that fits that. There are thousands of people that fit that for Bitcoin. So there are thousands of people with, in fact, this is all the people that were mining Bitcoin and understood it. All its, all its advocates from the get-go were people that understood distri distributed systems and network architecture and decentralization and how something could actually be state-free. These were the cypherpunks. These were the people that mm -hmm. actually had tried these things before and that could recognize that Satoshi had actually solved this problem. Ethereum is idealists, it's script kitties, it's, you know, a hundred developers that aren't worth one good Bitcoin developer. Uh, it's just really not going to make it. And you will never find someone who has that kind of experience and that kind of expertise who's not compensated by the crypto industry, who is an Ethereum maximalist. They don't exist. Yeah. Well, and I want to get to the point of, uh, so good note on ETH maxis. I want to get to the point of where's the next crater in the uh, in the industry. You look at, there's several yeah. that you could look at. <clears throat> Obviously, the VC side of things could get exposed. We could see some federal regulations, maybe even some laws and some lawmakers go after that market. You could also see another exchange kind of uh, roll into this. This was a tweet just talking about Binance. 75% of all exchange volume currently, this is eight and a half times the, uh, the size of its second place uh, exchange being Coinbase. Good or bad for the ecosystem. You also have uh, crypto.com out there. No, they don't like me very much because I'm not a big fan. But, um, you know, it, for many reasons, where do you think the crater could come from in the industry that could take us yeah, into a I little mean, bit of a, a sub position? Uh, I mean, I think the... I don't think Binance is going under anytime soon um, unless it's a regulatory thing, but that would basically just take out all non-Bitcoin crypto too, mm -hmm. in which case the industry just shrinks to non-US and without the American firms pumping and dumping to American institutional investors and people from around the world that invest yeah. in funds that are based in the US and have US figureheads, uh, I think the whole thing will just dwindle into you know near oblivion. Um, but unless and until that actually happens on the regulatory side, Binance should be fine because they and Coinbase play the casino operator game right, which is just take the house rake. It's plenty of money. That's enough. Uh, yeah. Don't bet half the house money on black every night and, you know, 
don't don't play your own games in the casino the way that FTX mm. Alameda did. Um, so they should be fine. Uh, the obviously fragile business models that shouldn't exist are Crypto.com and Nexo. Um, you know, those are those are not sustainable businesses. If they haven't blown up yet, it's just because they got lucky. They will blow up eventually because they have you know so much of their balance sheet is they're printed out of thin air, heavily manipulated token. Um, you know, these guys have all kinds of risk out there, loans out to different parties, et cetera. So, you know, I think, you know, those are not, those are not solid shops. Again, not people with experience doing these sorts of things. They're not any better than Mashinsky was when it comes to like expertise for running something like this. Um, so I just see them as sort of obviously fragile and will blow up eventually. And you should definitely not be storing any of your value on crypto.com or Nexo. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not really, I, I think there's probably another 50 to 100 crypto VC funds or hedge funds or whatever that are gonna shut down over the next year because they've blown big holes in their own funds and will just decide to wrap it up because the high water mark is just too hard to beat in the crypto market and they'd rather go and you know start a new token as long as the regulatory window is open and try to pump something instead of continuing to manage a fund it's uh it's much more uh it's a much easier path to uh to quick fast ill-gotten riches to go and pump a token than it is to keep running an underwater hedge fund so i think you'll see a lot of them close up shop yeah, we've. I mean, we've had our have opened our uh, show up to Chris, uh, the CEO of uh, Crypto.com, to come on and just talk about it. You know, let's get into some of the depth of where Crypto.com is holding and can it hold in terms of these market conditions if we continue to see more pressure uh, in general kind of hit the space. Let's talk about mining for a minute because I think this also has some validity of where this is going because many times we've had HUD 8 on our show many times Sue Ennis comes on our show uh, on on an ongoing basis. Uh, HUD had a problem uh, in Canada where they had some power situations with the Canadian government now shutting down one of their operation operations that'll cut hash rate. But overall when you look at hash rate and the general I have a I think I have a hash rate chart here. Yeah, this is it. So hash rate blue line all going up other than this most recent uh, move right here since about what is November 1st through the month of end of November, but still trend line going up. Uh, obviously trend line for uh, price on Bitcoin going down. Um, hash rates going up. Corey, where, where is this hash rate coming from if, if miners are in fact dealing with uh, less profitability? Uh, most likely yeah. they're getting piled in on equipment that they bought during you know, the, high, the high water mark that's getting deployed this year. Is it part that, or do you th see something more, you know, in the in a line with maybe nation states or zero cost energy countries going into mining Bitcoin? Where do you think this is coming from? Yeah, I mean, probably use Occam's razor and simplest explanation is the best. And you know, there are operators that have access to uh, cheaper power or even free or near free free power that are just being able to scoop up a lot of cheap cheap machines that have come on the market by those mm -hmm. that are in distress. You know, so you know, you've got you've got one banker representing all of the core scientific machines, uh, plus all of the Celsius machines. The Celsius machines obviously are not plugged in because those guys are completely incompetent and lying to everyone. Um, the core scientific machines being plugged in. Um, so you know, there's a lot of machines for sale at uh, pennies on the right. dollar uh, yeah. all over the market right now, and a lot of you think a that's lot of a machines good investment right seen, now. Again, depends the, on depends on your power, depends on your operation, and mm -hmm. it depends. Oh, if you're talking about like our public miners, a good bet. That's, well, no, that's not, a, no, not, that's a not that. I'm talking about actually like point by point. The machines, <laughs> yeah, oh. the machines <laughs> which we're seeing kind of flood into the market at a very low yeah. rate. Uh, so not for the, not for retail. Like onesie twosies, mom and pop shops. Like it's no, a we're talking about somebody that could start something up and maybe spin up a, a fair, yeah. a grid level type, uh, you know, operation, something like a riot or even a marathon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you need to have really deep pockets because your company, even if you are a, an incredible expert and you've gone through all the the trial and error of becoming awesome at Bitcoin mining. Yeah. Uh, it's still going to be hard to spread that knowledge and that know-how through your company. And so you're going to struggle for 
18 to 36 months anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. um, while there's little competition, if you can get the capital, this is not a bad time to make those mistakes and, yeah. and get started and scale up and then benefit from a future bull run. I think that's you know, potentially well, interesting, but what's going to be really hard is like the cost of capital is super high yeah, exactly. and You're everybody's good. shied away from, from funding this industry. And so, you know, we were talking a little bit in the pre-show, I've recently started an opportunity fund for the Bitcoin space with uh, some well-known gray hairs, uh, James Lavish, Larry Lapard, the former gold guy, still likes gold, loves Bitcoin. <laughs> um, and, uh, and Greg Foss, who's like a 35 year fixed income guy who's Greg on our show in the last couple of years. Good yeah, guy. Greg. Greg is very entertaining, very very smart, and wise <laughs> as wise being distinct from the word smart. Um, so yeah, so the you know this this crew is going and, and looking at some of these distressed situations, and then also looking at operators that really have the goods that have expansion yeah. opportunities and are suffering from a lack of of uh, uh, capital investment in the space, um, but actually have the numbers and have the plan to to do something special. So we're certainly looking. We have you know. A, a plan of two to 300 million bucks for that opportunity fund. We'll definitely yeah. be deploying into mining as part of that. I think there's huge opportunities in this space right now, especially in Bitcoin innovation, what we'll see in those markets, a lot of new Bitcoin, Bitcoin tech coming out. And I think this could be an, an actual kind of twilight for an opportunity to kind of start sparking into the industry. So uh, interesting stuff for sure. I want to wrap this up. I, know, I just looked down and I said, man, we've been going a while. Um, just a couple of things on Swan. You know, how are you guys making yeah. money? If I mean, I know you got a, you've got a you know a trade uh, cut that you're making on when, when Bitcoin is acquired, but mm -hmm. what yep. is the revenue model for you guys? Yeah, I mean, so that's been more than enough historically for us. Is just taking uh, 99 bips, like a one percent uh, fee on Bitcoin purchases. We don't have a sell button, uh, <laughs> so it's one way only. Um, what's nice when you're when you're Bitcoin only and you make as much noise in the education space as we do, the people that end up attracted to your platform are usually pretty into Bitcoin. And yeah. so if somebody's kind of gambling with crypto and doesn't understand Bitcoin, you know, they're likely to gamble one or 2% of their liquid net worth or something like that on yeah, crypto for in these greater full pockets. trading games. Yeah. So it's, it's deeper pockets, but also people with more conviction and you're going kind of deeper into the wallet. Um, mm -hmm. So we actually make significantly more money per user than Coinbase does, for instance, let alone any of these CFI lending platforms. Um, so that's just kind of an advantage that we have. So even though it's only one coin and it's only one way, people buy so much Bitcoin from us right. that it's enough to, to sustain a growing business. And we're one of the only companies, if not the only company of size that's growing in the space. You know, we've hired 10 people in the last month. We're about 100 people now. Uh, we're going global for card purchases next month. Um, we just launched uh, Swan Advisor for the wealth management channel in the United States. So we're literally the only platform that's Bitcoin only for uh, for wealth managers and RAs in the U.S. to get Bitcoin into their client portfolios. And if you're a fiduciary and you have clients, like you don't want to be in this other stuff anyway. It's going to make you look bad. It's going to yeah. make you look as bad as the Hollywood agents that got all these celebrities into these, you know, dog coins and NFTs and all this BS from from last year. And pumping FTX and things like that. I tried to warn all these Hollywood agents. I went to UTA, CAA, WME. I told them all in 2021 that you don't want your clients in this stuff. You're going to get egg on their faces. They don't listen. They take the money. They love the fees. And uh, now their mm. clients have egg on their faces. Yeah, I was looking at uh, this situation. When you look at, at kind of the, the cross metric be around uh, proof of work, proof of stake. Proof of work, I mean, Litecoin does fall into that category as well. What are your thoughts on Litecoin? It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. I mean, uh, monetary but, networks trend toward yeah. one. So hash power on Bitcoin versus hash power on Litecoin. Again, it's I don't think that Litecoin is a security. I think it's like, you know, just a proof yeah. of work coin that that won't be around, just like Bcash and BSV, um, Gren, like any of these tiny little proof of work coins uh, just aren't going to be around in the long run. They just dwindle versus Bitcoin over time. And when time, you say long like run, what are you thinking here? Five years? Three years? Uh, I mean, it may never die because people may own it when it's a penny, hoping that it goes to three cents if Elon tweets about it. Yeah. Right. So it doesn't it doesn't mean that it will ever completely die as long as there's people willing to mine it and people willing to talk about it. But, you know, I think we should all be thinking about things 
for the long run yeah. in Bitcoin terms. In the short run, obviously, the unit of account is dollars globally. So you think about sure. you know your your near term purchasing power in dollars. But otherwise, I think. You're a fool if you're not sort of accounting for your investments in Bitcoin terms, especially if you're thinking about non-Bitcoin crypto. And they all bleed out against Bitcoin over time. Last question to you is uh, Fidelity just launched their crypto accounts. So now you can get in. Yep. I've seen it and have had a couple of people that have actually been able to execute. What are your thoughts on Fidelity moving into this space? I mean, it's obviously a Bitcoin uh, strategy. They're yeah. going after first entry market. Where do you see this going? Yeah, well, I was, so they launched with Bitcoin. I think they announced that they were launching with Ethereum as well. Yeah, it's in there. Um, yep. I don't know if it's in there. So it's Bitcoin and Ethereum. You know, it's, uh, I think it's it's good because it's validating uh, for Bitcoin to have it available. And you've got the Fidelity name behind it. And they've been a custodian for Bitcoin for quite some time. Um, there are some Bitcoiners that work there, uh, which is good, including their CEO and uh, a few people on the venture side and things like that. So uh, I think it's good and it's validating for the space. Um, I think it probably makes our job a lot easier because, um, you know, they have a 1% spread. We have no spread and 1% mm -hmm. fees. So the pricing is the same, but our yeah. education is like a thousand times better. Our community is much better. And obviously we're not trying to get people to, uh, you know, gamble on a, on an, a ship coin, I guess is what I'm supposed to say on a, on a quality. Well, their, their problem I think is the one way in no, no wallet. So you've got no way to get it out unless you sell it. So that's, a, yeah. that's a bit of a, yeah, that's, it'll probably change that over time. It's, it's, yeah, it's an IOU there, but if they eventually make it so that you can actually have an off ramp and so that you can take control that's a of your keys. Deal. Yeah. Deal. I wish they had just launched that way. I think it would have been better to just hold it until they had it done. Cause otherwise you're just in a lot of the weird, market. If they did that. Yeah, it's very possible. Um, I think yeah. they should. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I welcome them to the space. It's, it's, I wish they had done it a few years ago. Would have made my job yeah. a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, Corey, I'm going to let you go. But I know you have a big event, Swan Bitcoin. Uh, we didn't get a chance to go to it when you just had it here recently. But do you have another one coming up soon? Or Yeah, what's the plan? yeah absolutely. So, so two things. Um, let me get in three real quick. So so the first is we're launching something called Swan Premium in a couple of months. And this is going to be like 20 bucks a month with tons of Bitcoin discounts, uh, extra access to events, webinars, things like this. So it's kind of okay. like a media right. and events package, cool. basically. It's yeah. free for anyone who signs up for the waiting list. So hmm. literally right now, today. if you go to swan.com slash swan.com slash premium any of your viewers are welcome to pile in there and you can be part of it uh and, and just uh enjoy that for a year on us and very cool not going to collect any payment info or anything you were mentioning pacific bitcoin which was mm -hmm. uh the largest yep. ever bitcoin only conference on the west coast it was in los angeles about three or four weeks ago it was an absolute smashing success happened to be the week that ftx was collapsing so it was just kind of uh interesting that everybody else was freaking out and the bitcoiners are having a massive party and having a blast and it was wildly successful and kind of roundly Bitcoin reviewed as the best bitcoin conference ways. ever yeah, yeah so we've sure. got another one of those coming up next year pacific bitcoin 2023 for tickets um to next year it'll be in october in la it looks All like right. um but yeah it's great and then the last thing cool. i would say is if you want to hang out with us more often um swan private which is our high net worth service so swanprivate.com we are now doing monthly events uh, every month in Los Angeles and every month in Miami for the entire year of 2023. Uh, so if you become a member of Swan Private, you can come and hang with famous Bitcoiners and, and enjoy some good content and free drinks and food on us in either uh, west side of LA like or South Beach uh, every month. Well, there you go. We're here in Miami, so maybe it's time for me to step in. Oh, you are? Happening. Yeah. Yeah, this come is here. Our home. Okay. Yeah, for sure. All right. All right, great. Corey, great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for stopping in today. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. So, you guys, just so you guys know, this is not a paid advert at all by Swan Bitcoin. We have Corey on. Mainly, he gives a, a new view, and that's what we're trying to do on the network here is give you guys some insights outside of the traditional things. We get into a lot of depth here on the network. So, don't, uh, you know, look at it for what it is education from all sources is what we welcome to the show. So if you have somebody you think is a great founder, a great innovator, then we want them on this show. Make sure and drop some comments below and we love all that good stuff. If you guys want to catch me, it is out there on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.